Hello everyone, today we are going to see how we can extrude a profile along a polygonal path. If you are like me and you like to play with the geometry nodes, you have probably already encountered this problem when you want to extrude a profile along a polygonal path and you end up with the result that's not exactly what you are looking for. Let's start by identifying the problem with a new empty Blender scene. Let's switch to the Geometry Node workspace by clicking on its tab on the top menu under the title bar of the main window. With the default cube selected, we can simply add a new Geometry Node modifier by clicking on the Add New button. Now, as an example, we can add a new curve primitive to use as a path, like a spiral, to replace our default cube. Now we can proceed by adding a new quadrilateral curve to use as profile for our extrusion. We set the size of the quadrilateral to a smaller value, like 0.2, and then we are ready to use the curve to mesh node to create our extrusion. As anticipated, we use the quadrilateral as profile for the extrusion. To better see the result, it's a good idea to turn on the overlay to see the face orientation and the wireframe of the mesh. This is exactly what we would use to model a pipe that has been bent along a smooth path. But what if we want to model a pipe or a steel profile that has been cut and welded together to form a polygonal path? To show you what I mean, let's try to replace our spiral curve with a star polygon. Now, if we zoom in and we take a look from the top, we can see that the result is not what we were looking for. As we can see, our section profile has been put on the vertex of our polyline. But since our polyline has straight edges and sharp angles, the result is a distorted profile that changes its section along its path. If we want to model a steel structure that has been made by cutting and welding together straight profiles, this is not what we want. Ideally, we would like to place our section profile in the middle of each segment and then extrude it straight along the path. Lucky for us, we don't actually need to move our profile around and create extra mesh points. We only need to stretch the profiles that we already have on the vertex of the polygon path in order to compensate for the deformation and thus obtain a constant section along all the path. In order to do that, we need to measure this angle. Using trigonometry, we can see that the correct size that we need on our vertex, multiplied by the sinus of the angle, gives us the original size of the profile. So we need to apply a correction factor that is 1 over the sinus of the angle. To obtain the angle that we want, we need to measure the angle between each segment of our polyline. This will require some vector math, but I will explain you each step as we create together the required node tree. To have a visual reference, we can call C the center of each section. Then we can call N the center point of the next section, and then we will call P the center of the previous section. We will use these points to calculate the vectors that identify the directions of each segment, one from the current point to the next point, and one from the current point to the previous point. And of talking, let's start by adding a geometry set position node that will allow us to change the position of each vertex of our final mesh. We will use as a reference the original position of each vertex as given by the input position attribute node. To have access to the vertex of the original curve while we edit the resulting mesh, we need to use the capture attribute node before the path curve is fed to the curve to mesh node. Instead of capturing directly the vertex position, we set the node to operate on integer and thus capture just the input index of the vertex. 
In this way, once we have saved the index of each point of the original path, we can retrieve the coordinates of the vertex using the transfer attribute node. Now we can use the original path curve as a source. We set it to transfer a vector using the index of the points as parameter. And finally, we use the position as the attribute to extract. In this way, if we use the index that we have saved as input, when we connect the output to the set position node, we move all the points of the final mesh to the point of the central path. This is not particularly useful, but we can check that so far we haven't made any errors. Since this node tree is complex, it's a good idea to keep track of what is what using a frame. And by pressing the F2 key, we can rename the frame to give it a meaningful label. To keep everything tidy, it's also a good idea to create a node group. Now we can avoid bifurcation by copying the group input node, but before doing that, we open the right menu by pressing the N key while the mouse cursor is on the node editor. This way, in the group tab, we can rename and sort the input parameters for the node group. Now we can insert inside the frame another input node group to feed the path curve directly to the source socket of the transfer attribute node. Now we can select and copy the frame and all its nodes using Ctrl C and Ctrl V, so we can have another copy to modify to access the next point. As usual, we use the F2 key to rename the frame. Now, as before, we feed the saved index to the transfer attribute node, but since this time we want the next point, we use a math node to add one to the saved index. Now, if we try to connect the output to the set position node, we can see that we have a problem with the position of the last point. As we may have expected, when we add one to the index of the last point, to obtain the next point, we got a problem. To fix it and have back or full star, we add a switch node and we set it to operate on integers. To detect when we need to switch the index to zero, we need to know the total number of points in our path curve. To do that, we use the domain size node. We set it to operate on curves and we feed it with the path curve. Now we can use a greater than or equal check to compare the index plus one with the number of points. In this way, when we reach the end of the path curve, we loop back to the start index at zero. Now we can do a similar thing to get the previous point. As before, we start by copying the nodes and renaming the frame. Since this time we want the index of the previous point, instead of adding one, we subtract one. Now we have to check if the new index is lower than zero. And to optimize the performance, we can specify that we are comparing integers. This time, when we reach the start, we need to jump to the last point that has index equal the total number of points minus one. Now let's try to connect the output to the set position node and see if we get what we want. Not quite, but maybe if we go back and properly connect the nodes. And as we are at fixing things, we can go back and change the type of check from float to integer. This is not needed, but is bothering me. Now that we have obtained all the reference points that we need, we can go on and calculate the vectors that define the angle. To obtain the vector that goes from the current point to the next, we use a vector math node to subtract c from n. Since we will use this vector to calculate the angle, we don't want the actual vector, but the versor that has length 1. So we use the normalized node. As usual, we use the F2 key to rename the frame to keep track of what is what. Now we can copy these nodes to obtain the direction to the previous point by subtracting C from P. In order to calculate the angle, it's important 
that we use the versors that are the vector of length 1 and that are going from the current point C in the direction of the next point N and the previous point P, respectively. In this way, we can now use the cross product node to obtain a vector that has a length equal the product of the two lengths of the original vectors and the sinus of the angle in between them. And since we used versors of length 1 to calculate the cross product, we can directly extract the sinus of the angle by using the vector length node and then the arc sinus node. Since the arc sinus function gives us an angle that is in between minus 90 degree and plus 90 degree, when we try to measure angles greater than 90, we will obtain this complementary angle, while the angle that we want is this. To detect when we need to correct the output, we can evaluate the dot product of the two directions, that is positive if the angle is less than 90 degree, and negative if the angle is greater than 90 degree. Now we can use a switch node to take into account the two different situations. When the dot product is greater than zero, we can use the angle as it is. Otherwise, we use a math node to radians to start from the flat angle, and then we use another math node to subtract the angle given by the arc sinus. Now that we have the angle in between the directions, we divide it by 2 to obtain the angle that we will use to calculate the correction factor. Now we can start to correct the position of the points, but to do that we first need a reference vector that identifies the direction of the correction displacement. To get that, we have just to add the two direction vectors together and then normalize the result to obtain a versor of length 1. As before, we use a frame and the F2 key to keep track of all the pieces of our node 3. Now that we have all the ingredients, we can finally start to correct the position of the points. If we consider a generic point X on the final mesh, which is represented by the position node, we can obtain its relative position from the center point C using a vector mat node to subtract C from the position. Now we can use the dot product node to obtain the projection of this relative position along our reference direction that identifies the direction of the displacement correction that we want to impose to each point. Since the dot product gives us only the length of the projection, we can use the vector scale node to obtain a proper vector. This represents the part of the position that we want to change. Now we can use another vector math node to obtain the part of the position that we want to preserve. In this way, when we stretch the part of the position that we want to correct, we can add back the part that we want to preserve to obtain the corrected relative position. To obtain the corrected displacement, we simply divide the length of the projection by the sinus of the angle that we calculated before. Now we can use another vector scale node to get the correction vector. And then, using a vector math node, we add the part of the position that we wanted to preserve to obtain the corrected relative position from the center point C. Finally, using another vector math node, we add the position of the center point C to obtain the absolute position of the corrected point that we can feed to the set position node. 
Nice, finally, a proper extrusion along a polygonal path. Since this was a complex topic with very hard math, you may find a more basic introduction to vector math in my Blender tutorial playlist that you can find at the end of this video. Now, to give the final touch and obtain a fully functional node group, we have to define what happens when the polygonal path is not closed. To change our closed star with an open path, we exit the node group by pressing Tab while we have the input node selected. Now we can add a set spline cyclic node on the path curve to obtain an open polygon. As we could have anticipated, we have a problem with the first and the last section, since we should modify them only when we have a closed path. To fix that, by pressing Tab while the node group is selected, we go back inside the node group. Now we need to create a Boolean check that is true only for the middle points or for all the points if the path is closed. Lucky for us, we already have a check that identifies the first point and the last point of the path curve. So we simply have to drag out the output of the check and add a boolean OR to combine them. Since the output of this node is true only for the first and the last point, and we want the opposite, we use a boolean NOT node to invert the output. Now, if we use the output of this node to feed the selection socket of the set position node, we apply the correction only on the middle point. Now, we have a node group that works only for open path. To have it working both ways, we go back and add another capture attribute node on the path curve. We set it to capture a boolean value and we use it to capture the isCyclic attribute of the path curve. This way we can access the value when evaluating the set position node. Now we can use another OR node to update the selection condition and have the node group work both with open and closed path. After all this work, it's a good idea to rename the node group, giving it a meaningful name, so in the future we can easily reuse it. As final touch, we can expose the fill cap option of the curve to mesh node simply by dragging its socket to an empty socket on the group input node. Since this was the hardest tutorial I've made so far, if you are still watching, you have all the right stuff to become an expert Blender user. And if you want to learn more about the geometry node, take a look at my Blender tutorial playlist. Bye bye!